Greetings, everyone. The webinar will beginning uh, will begin shortly. Just give everybody a few more minutes to dial in or a few more seconds, sorry. Great, and we will kick off. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And welcome to today's webinar entitled How Your Casino Can Leverage Artificial Intelligence to Drive Direct Bookings. First and foremost, I'd like to introduce you to today's speaker. Jack Catton is a seasoned digital marketing, sales, and consulting expert with over 15 years of experience in the hospitality industry. Currently serving as the digital marketing sales director at Sendine, he orchestrates and drives innovative strategies that redefine the landscape of digital marketing. Beyond the boardroom, Jack's flair for calculated risks finds expression in his love for the casino classic, Craps, where he expertly navigates the odds to mirror his strategic acumen in both professional and personal pursuits. Jack is Sendine's go-to expert for everything digital marketing, and he has a very exciting session lined up for you today. So before we get started, I would like to go over just a few housekeeping items that, that you know how to participate in today's session. So today's session is being recorded and you will receive a copy of the recording via email shortly afterwards. All attendees are on mute. So if you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom window. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and time permitting, we will address them during the live Q&A session at the end. Um, and with that, I would like to turn things over to Jack. So take it away, Jack. Thanks, Grace. Appreciate the intro there, very colorful. So uh, AI, kind of a hot topic these days. Um, I'm sure all of you have a neighbor, coworker, family member, like a cousin that's gotten into the AI topic with you and it's all doom and gloom, right? AI is gonna take over the world, the rise of the, uh, the robots. Well, they might not be wrong. That might happen down the road, but for right now, uh, AI actually has some pretty good useful things that it's driving, uh, particularly on the digital marketing side of the world for hospitality. So let's take advantage until uh, things uh, take a turn for the worse, right? So key talking points and takeaways uh, for today. Um, I'm gonna do a quick introduction on current AI practical use. Um, from there, I'm gonna touch on three different components that I think are worth diving uh, much deeper on that are being impacted by some recent AI breakthroughs. Uh, those are including search engine marketing, uh, some AI leading campaigning uh, that's coming out, uh, particularly on the Google side, uh, and connected TV as well. So first, let's take a general overview of AI. Where are we coming from? What does it look like today? Some unique examples related to travel and marketing that you might have already started to incorporate into either your personal life or into your business activities as well. So here's a little timeline for us uh, to take a, a walk down memory lane. Um, this is essentially the start uh, of AI to where we are now. And really, AI was, was birthed quite a long time ago uh, in the 1950s with the Mark I Perceptron. Don't worry if you haven't heard of it. It's not a household name, um, but it was a basic machine that was designed to recognize imagery, mostly landscapes. And it incorporated the first machine learning algorithm to do it. The only issue is it didn't work very well. <laughs> so it took uh, quite a while for anything else to really happen. The 70s and 80s uh, are referred to in this, uh, in this space as the AI winter. But the 90s saw quite a jump in computing prowess and artificial knowledge expansion. So much so that computers actually learned how to play chess very well. And in the 2000s, we entered the big data era and things really escalated. We saw cloud computing. We saw data storage come online high volume graphics processing capability. Computers aren't just winning chess now, they're winning Jeopardy. AI is incorporated into toys, self-driving cars. Those didn't work very well. Got some hiccups, still working on that. Uh, even delivery machines. We know Amazon's been trying to send those um, 
send those out. And of course, we all have our friendly personal assistant devices these days, your series, your Alexas. And face recognition AI has largely been adopted in many cases to replace standard password security. But the real breakthrough that has come in just the last year and a half or so is the evolution and creation of generative AI. So most of you have heard of ChatBT. You might have already played with it a little bit. That was the first real successful breakthrough of this type of intelligence. So what's the big difference with generative? I actually like to use a music analogy um, for this. So standard iterations of artificial intelligence could be given a Mozart symphony and asked to play it. And it can do so in the matter of moments. Great. This new version and iteration of generative artificial intelligence in the same scenario could be given that Mozart symphony, play it back in a matter of moments, but additionally, it would be able to take that symphony, seek out other pieces of music that are similar to it, and from all of those pieces, write its own original symphonies in similar style. That's cool, but also a little scary, right? <laughs> but that's really where generative AI is at at the moment. So that brings us to present day. Uh, just the difference of 25 years from 1998 until now, we went from Furbies. Uh, that's one of the toys that had a little bit of AI included in it. Still scares the child inside of me a little. Uh, to Hollywood actors and writers being concerned that they might be out of a job in the next 10 years. You remember the big Hollywood strike incorporated AI concerns. But I'm here to tell you those concerns aren't unfounded. Deep fakes are actually real. For example, this picture that you saw on the post for registration and you see on screen now, that is not me. This is what a popular headshot AI bot, Aragon, thinks I look like in a professional setting. The bio that Grace introduced me with uh, prior to me starting this session, I didn't write it, nor did she. That's a chat GPT written description of who I am just from me giving them a few snippets of my background and interests, the robots did the rest. So pretty wild. Now, it's not a totally perfected science yet. These are some of the other headshots that I received from Aragon and no one wears a suit in what looks like a spa or sauna setting traditionally, which is what you see on the left-hand side. And I certainly wouldn't go mountain climbing in a tie to enjoy my cup of coffee in the morning. Uh, also, ChatGPT, uh, I used a snippet from the entire description that they had. It was a bit wax poetic on some of my background. So I had to manually dial it back a bit, um, but just an idea of some of those practical uses and where they are now. So what does it look like in the travel sector? Outside of headshots and bios and helping to build resumes, here's some of the ways that the travel sector and travelers have started to incorporate AI into their day-to-day -day dealings. A lot of you have already experienced that, uh, you know, larger airlines and hotel chains and maybe some of your, um, your gaming casinos have those uh, online chat bots to help, you know, deliver easy to answer uh, answers to questions. Uh, and sometimes actually even process bookings. Um, so those are in play on quite a few websites in the hospitality sector today. We also have flight forecasting. So a lot of you have probably already incorporated this as well. Uh, this is Hopper. It uses AI to forecast what days will be best for low cost flights, accommodations, all the way down to even like rental cars and dining reservations. Call centers also incorporate AI. So there's call scripting artificial intelligence that provides customer service professionals with scripting that applies directly to conversations they're having with customers. And it makes dynamic recommendations on how to change the script to get to a better outcome with customers. Beyond that, there's even some more generative artificial intelligence that's being built. Uh, an example is Poly AI, which actually happens to be a Sendine product, where it actually takes the human aspect out of the call center where it's a virtual call assistant that actually sounds almost entirely like a human that uses its own call scripting to better and improve its results with customers along the way. And then you have travel planning. So that's a new way that AI is being used in the travel industry to personalize travel planning based on past user engagement uh, and what intent is being sought. 
So current AI capabilities are also pretty adept at marketing content creation for travel. Writer's block is essentially the thing of the past here. ChatGPT whipped this up uh, in about four seconds for me for the win. Um, I essentially asked, hey, you know, I want to have some ad content for promoting uh, stay three nights, get the fourth night free offer. Um, let them know which uh, property I wanted to do that for. Um, and boom, processed it almost uh, instantaneously. Now, we're not quite there yet with display ads, but uh, the contextual stuff is pretty solid. There are some, just as a note, copywriting concerns and questions floating out there on like how and where this content can be used because I didn't write it, this machine did. Do I have to like give the machine credit? Uh, so there's potentially legislation that's looming to define that better. So just keep that in the back of your mind um, as these things progress. So moving on, some of the largest ripples for artificial intelligence is the big changes coming for search engines over the next few years. And really, there's a big change coming this year. Um, so the timing of this webinar is relevant. Of course, the market leader, Google, is the only real search engine most people pay a lot of attention to, given its ownership of nearly the entire market share for search engines. So let's talk about what Google is planning this year, 2024. So following just behind OpenAI's introdu introduction of ChatGPT, um, Google announced that they are going to be having a um, creation of their own generative search experience. And it's currently in uh, Google Labs state right now, um, which means it's available for use, but only if you want to be a Labs participant. So they announced this in May 2023. And what the intent is, is they want to reimagine what a search engine is providing to users of it and create more engagement directly on the search results pages before people are jumping to the websites of interest. So the mainstream rollout is coming in 2024, unless Google delays it. And right now, the target is sometime in Q2, so right around the corner. So expected impacts. With this addition of the generative artificial intelligence into search results, users are going to be spending a lot more time engaging search results, which is going to actually in turn create less traffic from informational queries. But the traffic that does come into uh, websites will be a higher quality traffic, people that are actually ready to take action. They've got all the information that they need from the search results pages. They're coming to the website to actually take action on that information. So the idea of lost traffic may sound scary. You know, you're going to see a dip, but the conversion is actually probably going to improve um, on the things that you're selling on site. So from a search engine optimization standpoint, long tail keywords and semantic markup are going to be very important. So if you're not familiar with semantic, um, semantic search engine optimization is about optimizing content for a specific topic rather than a specific keyword or phrase. So this in turn can allow search engines to better identify the content of your website against user intent, past search experience, and relationships with previous search concepts. Longtail similarly is making sure we look at all the different new ways that potential guests may be using generative search to shop for hotels and casinos and what sort of rabbit holes they might potentially go down. For example, I want a hotel with a pool or I need a casino with a hotel that has a handicap accessible pool or I need one that is on the rooftop. Does it serve lunch? Does it have a bar? Etc. So those are the ways that they're going to break down in this generative search experience um, as they're trying to gather additional information. And semantics been around for a little bit of time and the traditional search result, which I show an example of on screen for Gansevoort meatpacking, is what that old search experience used to look like. If you did a good job at semantic markup, if somebody asked the question, what hotels have a rooftop pool in the meatpacking district, the Gansevoort Hotel Group would answer it. It's not the only hotel in the meatpacking district that has a rooftop pool, but they're the ones that did the semantic markup the best on the optimization side. So optimizing for the new future, new engaged future guests, you need to make sure your website is prepared for the new ways users will be entering your website when you're represented in generative search. They're going to be much farther down the road in their research to not just identify a location that they want to stay, 
but amenities they seek, dining they prefer, and who knows, maybe even the thread count of the sheets. You never know. So ensure that your website is segmented out in a way where a click-through can find the relevant information they wanted to see when they jump to the next phase of their travel journey. So focus on amenities, key selling points, and location, and make sure that those things are deep linkable. I don't want all of that content on one page. It needs to be split out into separate pages where everything is easy to find top of fold on that click-through. Accessible content in multiple formats is also going to be very, very beneficial. So video and imagery will be much more front and center in the new generative search experience. So make sure your website has as much of that as possible. Imagery and videography should be experiential whenever you can, which means, hey, show people enjoying the property in various ways. Those are the things that resonate better than an empty hotel room with a bed. And they should always include alt text um, behind the video and imagery so that the AI generative search knows when it's relevant to pull into those results. So this is an example of the Cosmopolitan Las Vegas. And this is the new generative search experience. And you could see how front and center all of that imagery is um, outside of the written content that's there. So very front and center. So, also looking at paid search, um, for businesses, Google has touted that the generative search experience will drive a more informed user to the digital storefront. So more qualified clicks, right? Better returns on investment. Someone that already has most of the information they need to decide on a purchase is the ones that are going to be clicking on your advertisements. And search ads are going to be in the mix along the way of this search engagement. Um, so it's not all going to be organic in that new generative search environment but they still need to be re relevant options and content to users. So what we foresee is that competition in the paid search realm is going to increase. More businesses will factor in a broader set of keywords to try and inject themselves into search-based research of potential guests. CPCs are actually going to decrease slightly, expected, given that there's going to be an increase in servable inventory. Think it's not just going to be the top three placements of a static search result that you're bidding for anymore, but several places to place an ad in every different question in the conversation of generative search. Click-through rates will decrease as well. Users are waiting to jump to a website until they receive all the information they think they can get from the search results themselves. In relation to ad copy, special offers and incentives may still be helpful, but it's more important to focus on content that is as informative as possible to the user. So you wanna reduce the question marks of the content to reduce a quick click through to see what the ad is actually saying. The clicks produced need to focus on the informed user that has high propensity to book. Broad match keywords. Allow your search ads to appear to a more broad set of searches and questions by users than what is in your paid search keyword strategy today, right? The machine learning on this on Google's backend has improved greatly, thanks generative search AI. And the learning period it takes the ad server to identify keywords that are successful versus not is much shorter. So you even have the option of turning on brand control in broad match that keeps your broad match strategy focused on your particular brand being included in the query. My recommendation is to play around with broad match without the brand control and see what it yields first, because I've seen that it can be highly successful in a lot of scenarios. So here's just a look at the current user experience on generative search in Google. Uh, I am a lab user. So you can see that it dominates the top of the fold. The organic is well below, um, or the old search experience. Information provided is dependent on hotel location, source content. So there's a lot of referral sources that you can see. Additional questions are always prompted to encourage additional data gather, which you can see I just asked another question, and I have a whole series of other additional bits of information. Um, and you also have the ability to see reviews um, as well as comments from other users. And in 2024, like men I mentioned, sponsored placements are going to be included. So everything that you would see in this search uh, experience now uh, is going to be organic. But as soon as the rollout happens, uh, that paid content, that sponsored content is going to start to pop. So an additional recommendation here, uh, you could sign up for the current beta in labs. It's open to US ba based users. Anybody that's in Google Chrome, you'll see a little beaker, science beaker up in the top right hand or left hand corner of your screen. Click it, 
It's going to ask you if you want to be a part of the generative search trial. Play around once you do that with how your brand is represented with questions you think potential guests might ask about your property. Um, are you representing the way that you want? Test out destination-based searching as well. So follow-up queries about specific amenities you know separate you from your competitive set. You should appear in those search results for that. And then figure out where you represented correctly versus not, right? If you're not represented correctly, take it to the team that's running your search engine optimization to see what adjustments they can make to make sure that that works. So on to uh, AI marketing control. Um, so artificial intelligence is being asked in a lot of cases now to serve ads to the right users in the right place at the right time and to be purely channel agnostic. So once again, Google is actually at the forefront of this type of marketing model. And I could show you what that looks like. So Google Performance Max, actually been around for a few years. Some of you might have already heard about it or been using it from Google's end. They identified a way to serve ad inventory in new places that weren't currently being purchased very often. Not a lot of folks are setting up ad campaigns for Gmail specific ad space inventory, right? So for advertisers, it's a way to expand visibility, showcase ads to qualified users in place they weren't approaching before. And you could couple this with the AI component that is identifying past user engagement across the Google ecosystem to identify their interests and pattern needs. The intention is that your ads are served at a relevant time in the right spot to the right user in a dynamic real-time way. But Google loves travel, right? And users love using Google for travel research. So the travel sector, Google wants to invest and double down on that. Right, so they created a unique iteration of Performance Max called Performance Max for Travel Goals. Not the sexiest name, but it is pretty sexy. Uh, it was originally forecasted to harvest like a five to one return on ad spend by Google. It quickly blew past that in the beta phase. Um, so it was actually producing double digit return on ad spends over a 10 to one. The generative AI takes a big role in this, and this is a big difference from standard Performance Max, content creation. You provide your visual assets and information about your property, and it generates the ads for you. So if you're lacking on video collateral, another cool thing it can do is it can even create video ads based on the images you provide with text overlay and calls to action. On the ad serving side, that's the other big difference. Once the ads are deployed in the wild, behind the scenes, the ad serving AI is reviewing performance by placement. It identifies what Google channels are yielding the best results as well as things like the time of day the ad was served that produced a click within the channel. It also looks at performance by ad unit. What messaging and visual combinations are the most successful? What isn't working as well? As more data comes in, the platform will adjust which ads are served to focus on the most successful and make recommendations on additional ad units it would like to try in the future and create them. Pretty cool, right? So just an example of how this works. Um, here's an example of a guest starting their research of trip, taking a trip to Las Vegas, all the way up to when they make their booking. Traditional digital marketing would have split out these various targeting tactics and in turn segmented how we would approach this potential user. Performance Max for travel goals, it dynamically targets the user once qualified by interest across the entire Google ecosystem when they are close to engaged on travel research. That's the timing component. With content, it dynamically creates and optimizes based on what performs best over time. So it's prospecting. And when Google first rolled this out, like I said, very low return on ad spend uh, expectations that they set. But I was a part of the pilot that reached double digit ROAS, and it was within two weeks that it did that campaigning. So the AI here isn't just sound, it's working far and above expectations. I still recommend some traditional campaigning segmented out between display, paid search, hotel ads, et cetera, to have more control on when and where you spend and advertise. And you use this as an additional supplement to the strategy. But that might change fairly soon as PMTG continues to shine, right? So next, on to connected TV. Uh, kind of an up and comer, if you will, in the digital marketing uh, realm, particularly as it relates to the travel sector. 
I think you guys all know what CTV is, but I'm talking about connected TV. Most TVs available for purchase today come with a smart TV component, and even your older TV, you can get it connected via streaming device like Apple TV, uh, Amazon Fire Stick. Yeah. Traditional TV ads had to be planned a year in advance and offered little room for adjustments. Pivoting content was difficult, if not impossible. CTV has more automation in its approach. And this automation allows advertisers the ability to launch campaigns for CTV in a matter of hours and the ability to optimize their strategy, which is placement and content throughout the campaign. So why now? 58% uh, of boomers are now watching streaming TV and more streamers now watch ad supported content, which is about 86%, than ad free content. It's the most watched form of TV in 2023, so it surpassed traditional. Ad-supported streaming is more popular than ad-free, and it's powering most of the streaming's growth, right? So people are encouraging to stay on the ad content side rather than paying for no ads. On the AI side, the same machine learning engine that knows to recommend a similar show or channel while you're engaged is the same machine learning engine that provides advertisers with who and where to showcase their ads. Creating a connected TV ad placement has also gotten some new generative AI touch, right? So if you're loading messaging, image, and video content, uh, there's now a generation module that can assist in building a 15-second ad spot, as an example. Um, so you don't have to hire a brand agency to create those for you. You can kind of do it as a self-serve. And multi-channel matters, right? There are new innovative ways to keep people engaged from connected TV cross device with the incorporation of things like on screen QR codes. An example of this that I saw is recently during some NFL games I was watching. There's a large pizza brand that literally has a 15 second commercial of a large QR code and a spokesperson reminding the viewer that they have time before the game resumes to scan that code with their phone and order some pizza and wings before the game resumes really, really smart stuff, right? And on top of that, 23% uh, of connected TV viewers actually ended up making a purchase after seeing an ad. And because we can actually track this stuff cross device now, we're able to quantify that and see that engagement that occurs. So it's a cost-effective alternative to traditional TV advertising, and you could reach highly targeted audiences without needing costly media buys. So what's the best way to get into the connected TV game? You can buy direct. Um, you can buy direct via partners like Hulu, Tubi, YouTube, all those things. Gain access to targeting via their interest past engagement algorithms. But I actually recommend that you run it through uh, Google's Display and Video 360 platform. And I know at this point, you probably think that I have a side hustle for Google behind the scenes, but it's, they're really the top innovators in this, this generative AI space. So buying CTV through the Google DV360 via programmatic approach has a lot of benefits, but it includes you, use your, you can use your first party data to create past guest campaigns, lookalike audience targeting. You can have all the CTV campaign data in one place across streaming options, which is helpful. You can recognize your reach potential with each publisher and streaming outlet. You can manage ad frequency to avoid annoying people and, you know, spending too much per user. Don't hit them seven times in a day if they're not engaging with your ads. You can also target by geography to focus on top feeder markets for your property and location. And you have two AI components working as one, the connected TV interest-based artificial intelligence, as well as the Google ad serving based artificial intelligence. Success metrics are improving with CTV as well versus traditional TV, which relied solely on reach. Like how many people did we get in front of? That was it. So DV360, we've got a lot of different tracking that's available to include user attention metrics. Did they turn the volume up to see what the ad had to say or were they on mute? Did they skip the ad or did they watch the ad all the way through? YouTube brand extension lets viewers engage with ads on connected TV screens via QR codes or even text messaging and push messaging. And like I mentioned, we can also look at cross device attribution. If a viewer, if a user views an ad on connected TV and ends up purchasing on their phone, we can measure that cross device to an ROI. So DV360 allows for first party data targeting, like I mentioned, and that lookalike audience targeting creation as well, which means you can have some really 
tight audience segments that you can you can send these ads to as well. So in summary, I hope you found this information helpful. I have some takeaways, some homeworks for you for digital marketing teams and agencies um, that you can talk through with them. And I expect all of you to have show up ads show up on my generative search feeds in my Gmail account and while I'm watching Hulu in the next week or two, get on that. But some final thoughts for you on AI in general. AI innovation in the digital marketing space, along with the changes to data privacy that's removing things like third party data usage from marketing tactics, mean you have to relook at your go to market strategy as it relates to digital. AI is a tool to actually help you navigate the new first party data focused marketing landscape. So make sure you take advantage. Don't ignore the fact that generative AI will have a systemic impact on the global economy, not just like 10 years from now, like this year. The travel industry is really well positioned. Uh, there's a lot of investment in it from the AI side to reap some of the benefits of this. But we as an industry have to stay informed and ahead of the curve on how to best utilize additional capabilities as they roll out. You want to explore and ask questions a lot. Get yourself into generative search, test it for your brand, like I, I recommended. Get a ChatGBT subscription and see what it can do. Be ahead of the curve on knowing what AI is capable of doing for your business before your competitive, before your competitor across the street does, right? And lastly, ask questions of your peers. See what experience they have had using AI for various business results. And also ask artificial intelligence. Like it's, it, it will tell you what it's up to these days. They love to answer questions about themselves. That's kind of their main function is answering questions and gathering information. So get in on ChatGPT and ask what it can do for you in the next couple of years or so um, and other iterations of AI as they come along. So thanks. Um, that's all I have for you today. And uh, I will switch it over to Q&A. Perfect. Thank you very much, Jack. Um, we've had a few questions come through from the audience. Um, so I will read them out. The first one is a two pronged question. So I'll read it out and then maybe you'll want to answer it in part. So uh, first part of the question is, is it expected that Performance Max for travel goals will have the ability to serve ads in the new Google generative search user experience next year? And if so, would it be better to do traditional paid search ads or let Performance Max handle the paid search placements? Yeah, great question. And I, I touched on it a little bit, but just, just to um, reconfirm. Um, the answer is yes, performance max for travel goals will be involved in ad inventory um, uh, when, it, when it comes out in, in generative search. Um, where those ad units are going to live and play uh, is entirely dependent on Google, what Google decides, but they have already confirmed that performance max for travel goals will be injected into that generative search experience. However, there is going to be a little bit more control, um, just manual control by having paid search ads traditionally out in generative search as well. So I do still recommend using both, um, especially as things are still fleshing out on the Google side as to where and when they want to serve that ad inventory. But consider this, you can have a traditional uh, keyword strategy that you still roll out. And like I said, don't make it a keyword strategy, make it more of a conversation topic strategy as it relates to paid search. Deploy what you think is going to work best. Also use performance max for travel goals. And it's actually just going to cast a wider net on the things that you didn't think about when you created that original conversation topic strategy um, and capture an additional audience out there that wasn't originally forecasted. So it's just going to expand your reach by doing both. Perfect. Um, we have another one that's come through um, regarding connected TV. So sure. Uh, what buying model is Connected TV on and what is a typical cost? Yeah, good question. Um, so Connected TV is on a CPM model. Um, that's cost per thousand impressions for anybody that hasn't, hasn't been engaged in that type of deal. Uh, and the cost is typically like Connected TV generally. Uh, if you were to Google search, like how much is the CPM buying Connected TV? 
uh, you get an answer that sounds really expensive, which is like 20 to 25 bucks uh, CPM cost. However, um, given the new uh, AI uh, updates and the ability to highly hyper-focus target different audience pools, think your lookalike audience targets, your exact match targets, using AI to actually segment out audience-based interest and travel-related content, the more focused the audience that you're actually targeting to, the lower the CPM becomes. So you're not, I think it was Pizza Hut that was throwing those QR codes to everybody watching the NFL game on a streaming device. Those CPMs are expensive. You're trying to reach a national audience. If you're actually trying to reach an audience of say 4,000 people that are actually engaging a travel show about Vegas, and that's the ad serving that you wanna do based on that interest, that CPM is gonna actually come down quite a bit, more than likely more than half. So it can be really cost-effective as long as you're leaning on artificial intelligence to quantify really hyper-focused targeted audiences on connected TV uh, to serve those ads to specifically. Perfect. Thank you, Jack, for those comprehensive answers. Um, I think that brings us up to about time. So um, before closing, uh, first of all, I'd like to extend a special thank you to you, Jack, for sharing your expert insights in today's action pack session. Uh, also, thank you to the attendees and registrants for dialing in and asking your questions. If there's anything that comes up afterwards that you didn't get a chance to address today, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, you can contact us at info at send9.com. Also, similarly, if you'd like to know more about Sundine's digital marketing services, visit us at sundine.com or reach out to the email uh, that's live on your screen. And Jack. Um, I can so help. We'll, he can help. He's our go-to man. So um, thank you again, everyone, um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks thank for attending. You.